I feel very honored to be speaking here, and but it's really sad, and uh, uh, I kind of hoped that this moment would never come. Uh, I am different in several ways from uh, all the other speakers at this conference. And I kind of feel like an ambassador for two different groups in this way. So first of all, it's people uh, from the field uh, that where John suddenly came and completely devastated the field with his power and which led to a complete redefinition of the field. And I will tell you the story of one such field. And uh, second of all, I uh, represent people who got to uh, collaborate with John without actually uh, uh, interacting with him personally, uh, well, with, without uh, interacting with him personally that much. So I was never a resident at the institute and uh, I counted, we probably intersected uh, for a total of less than three weeks over the years. That were, there were two conferences, there was exactly one day that I visited him at the institute and he visited Irvine a couple of times. So, but we communicated quite a bit uh, electronically. And interestingly, actually, it was not so much about the papers we wrote. We had, uh, uh, we wrote a couple, but we had uh, very little communication about that. It was, uh, but we communicated about mathematics and gradually, it morphed into some sort of friendship, I would say. And uh, to me, Jan was someone who always supported me uh, very strongly, even before we actually started communicating. Uh, so I have a, a few papers in top journals, for example, and I'm pretty sure that um, uh, most of them are there as a result of his interest and his support. And uh, a couple of times uh, uh, when the paper wouldn't, uh, would, would be rejected by uh, a, a top journal and I get upset and John would tell me, oh, if you don't want to deal with the referees, just send it to journal of EMS and uh, to such and such editor, and I would, and the paper would be accepted in three days. <laughs> so uh, I have to confess, I have two papers like that, that uh, I am pretty sure never underwent any serious refereeing. They were just accepted on Jan's word, and that was all very important to me, of course. But uh, more importantly, uh, of course, he was someone I admired tremendously, both as a mathematician and as a person. I really cherished the little communication we had, and I uh, feel a deep sense of, profound sense of personal loss. But anyway, so I am, I will talk about this field as I promised, and after the two talks this morning, today, two beautiful talks where uh, I personally learned quite a bit of exciting things. It's too much to absorb, so my talk will be lighter so that you can absorb all the wonderful material from the previous talks. And, uh, but uh, I will kind of explain uh, the field and what John did to it. So, uh, and I will start with some motivation. And it was a big motivation for the field itself and it was a big motivation for me personally, but I don't think it was a motivation for John. And I think I actually know what was the motivation for John. Well, it's a speculation, of course, but I think I have a good idea, but I'll tell this later in the talk. So, but uh, 
In some sense, at least half of how the, this field has started is from a certain physics model, which is not, so the field that I'm talking about is ergodic Schrodinger operators. But it started from a model that is not an ergodic Schrodinger operator, but from this tight binding uh, model of two-dimensional electron in a magnetic field. So the dividing model you, means you have an operator on L2, Z2 mathematically, and it is just a Laplacian in a magnetic field. So you have, you incorporate a certain gauge, and this lambda represents the uh, certain distortion in the lattice. So uh, this was uh, actually introduced in physics literature by Parles in 33, but uh, it is, uh, this operator is essentially periodic in one direction, and after you do, uh, you, you, if you write it this way in this particular gauge field, uh, if you, after you do the flocke decomposition, it essentially reduces to this operator that is called the almost Matthew operator. And uh, you see that it is a one-dimensional operator. So it reduces actually to direct sum of such operators in this parameter data. But you see that it's a one-dimensional discrete Schrodinger, that's what we call it, and uh, this potential given by the values of the function along the trajectory of, a, of an uh, rotation. And rotation can be rational or irrational. <coughs> and uh, the, what makes this model beautiful is, uh, 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 when people realize it is beautiful, uh, it, it is a picture produced by Hofstadter in 1976. It's a picture of spectra of this operator, one-dimensional or two-dimensional is the same thing, uh, as a function of um, this parameter alpha. This is a picture produced for rational alpha, but it is clear that things get very interesting when alpha gets irrational. There is self-similarity <laughs> governed by continued fraction expansion of this alpha. So uh, uh, this uh, picture somehow, for me personally, this has been the main motivation, and I am a card-carrying addict of this model. I, uh, produced embarrassingly many papers on this model alone, but uh, again, I think this was not the motivation for Jean. So, uh, uh, so uh, of course, as a mathematician, you want to uh, generally look at something more general than this, and what is more general than this? If you want to go the most general, you enter this ergodic Schrodinger operator. So what is that? Uh, you have an operator acting on L2 of ZD now. It was Z1 for this uh, previous <coughs> model, and you replace this cosine by function B on some measure space, and uh, you replace the rotation, and irrational rotation is when the model gets particularly interesting in the previous model, and you replace it by an ergodic action of ZD. And uh, you take a discrete Laplacian, basically your favorite discrete elliptic operator. So uh, these operators, actually the spectrum and spectral components are the same for almost every phase, so it's interesting to study it as a function of all the rest, but actually phase also plays some importance. But uh, there are two uh, models specifically that uh, uh, are very physically motivated and that, that have captured the most attention. These are quasi-periodic operators closer to what I started with, and uh, this is when uh, our, our dynamical system is rotation of the torus. And Anderson model, it's where the potential are IIDRVs. And basically, this field uh, was sort of defined as we know it and what problems are interesting, what problems people want to look at in the 80s by uh, two people the way I see it from today. It's by Barry Simon and Tom Spencer. 
and Tom in particular wrote uh, a very influential, very influential review papers uh, where he specified a number of problems uh, in this field, so kind of the models he considered interesting. And we'll come back to that. So um, now these operators uh, are also very interesting mathematically because they tend to have uh, very exotic spectral properties. So somehow if you uh, think of something that you can make a bet that never happens in interesting, in important, uh, in relevant problems, and then you'll find it in this class of operators often generically. So it uh, also makes it kind of fascinating. And again, I have a feeling, so to me this aspect was also always very motivational. I have a feeling that it is not what motivated Jean. Also, this field has uh, somehow uh, obscenely many, I should say, relation with uh, what people consider important physics. So several Nobel Prizes, and it is all true, they all somehow related to this model, especially the Anderson localization related to the Anderson model, but the others are directly related in some way to this quasi-periodic model, particularly this little cosine model. Uh, there is also one Fields medal that related to that, but again, uh, I don't think that that's what motivated John. So what did motivate him, I think, and let's get closer to that, is that uh, if you start studying it mathematically, you immediately, so how do you want to study something? Uh, you want to perturb from some scenario where you uh, can, uh, from some simplest scenario. So there are actually three scenarios where things simplify. Uh, let us uh, consider, for example, uh, quasi-periodic operators. One scenario is when your frequency is rational. You have periodic operators that are much better understood and you can perturb around that. I will not actually talk about this today. But uh, more generally, of course, it's natural to look at is a small or large values of lambda and consider this as perturbation of correspondingly zero lambda or infinite lambda, which is equivalent to zero Laplacian. So if lambda is small, at least in one dimensional case, uh, it is sort of close to a classical question of um, um, perturbation problem for ODEs and you do expect reducibility by KM for ODEs for the open time fluxes. And uh, if lambda is large, uh, you, it becomes a perturbation of pure diagonal. And notice that pure diagonal, of course, has pure point spectrum and localized delta function eigenfunctions. But since your values of your potential, remember it's an ergodic potential, they're dense in the range of this function V. If you do naive perturbation theory, for example, it becomes infinitely degenerate and you get small denominators of the form Vn minus Vm uh, to the minus one and uh, you uh, need to see uh, how they appear, study how they compete. So it's again, it's a small denominator problem. So small denominator problems are treated by KM. And it is uh, also easy to see if you look at the time dependent, corresponding time dependent Schrodinger equation. So if you look at uh, lambda equal to zero, uh, uh, you of course, if you start with something with finitely many excited eigenmodes, your solution will be quasi-periodic in, in, time, in time motion on the corresponding torus. And you want to see how this uh, persists when you 
turn on the small lambda. So this is again a classical KM question, KM in infinite dimensional space, and you can expect it to do it again under the Dalton time condition. So um, a similar question actually arises in Hamiltonian PDEs. There are very similar small denominator problems. So again, if you look, for example, at the linear Hamiltonian PDEs, and if you take epsilon equal to zero, this is a completely similar scenario. You have, if you have finitely many mu n's, you have a finite dimensional torus, and you want to study what happens when you turn on the epsilon. So, uh, and naturally these problems have been approached by the KM methods. So for uh, quasi-periodic operators, probably the first uh, KM method was developed in dimension one by Dinaburg Sinai and uh, kind of the ultimate early paper was by Eliasson. Uh, for large coupling, also the results were only for dimension one. There were separate papers by Sinai and Freulich, Spencer, and Witwer in late 80s treating the cosine type potential here by different kind of, I, would, I should say, KM type methods. And then Eliasson, a more direct KM, uh, did it for analytic potentials in 97. Uh, these results were what we now call perturbative in the sense that, as usual for KM, uh, all the constants, uh, large constants, largeness of the constants required dependent on the uh, alpha, on this parameter alpha. Now, uh, for Alex Spencer Witwer's work was actually uh, in some sense, an adaptation to this scenario of the really powerful method uh, called multiscale analysis that they developed for multidimensional Anderson model in the 80s. And uh, this method actually proved localization for the Anderson model. Again, I call it KM. It is a very... Uh, sort of to give it a name, but in some sense it is a KM type scheme. And uh, the original for Alex Spencer work was actually pretty involved. I did read it as a student. It required, uh, had some rather complicated combinatorial accounting of resonances and of how the how things change from scale to scale. It has, it was developed by many people and it it was significantly simplified later in the 90s, especially in the work by von Dreyfus Klein and Germine Klein, but it is uh, still uh, in some sense a KM type scheme. Uh, now, what are the problems with the results obtained this way for the Anderson model? Uh, first of all, it really required uh, Anderson model, a reminder, is when the potential is high IDRVs. So it did require ID, at least it did require independence, let's put it this way. Uh, also, it required absolute continuity, or at least holder property of the underlying random vari uh, variables, because uh, uh, several steps, and I will explain it in the next, in one of the next slides, were based on um, sort of rank one, uh, ability to do rank one perturbations continuously. So actually, for, Un for the Anderson model, there was a strong non-KM non method by Eisenman Molchanov, also later developed, very short and beautiful technique, but again, the same problems required independence and required absolute continuity of the underlying distribution. So uh, now going to Hamiltonian PDE, this basically is very related to Gigliola's talk. Yesterday there were papers 
by various sources for one dimensional case and uh, uh, various assumptions. I don't want to go into technical detail. But then John has worked on that quite a bit and he did the ultimate result for dimension one. And then he uh, constructed time quasi periodic solutions in dimension two. And uh, again, it's related to what Gigliola mentioned yesterday. It is a long, very powerful paper, 80 pages. Uh, so John kind of did the ultimate thing that could have been done by KM methods at the time uh, there. So now this uh, brings me to what Jean did uh, in uh, quasi-periodic operators and applied also to Hamiltonian PDEs. And this is development of robust, uh, what I would say, non-KM, non-perturbative methods for this uh, uh, small, classical small denominator problems. And uh, what this involves is uh, direct estimates on the, of the Green's function in the, uh, for one dimensional case in the regime of positive Lyapunov exponents. And uh, it's a bit different in multidimensional case. I'll go into a bit more details in the next slide. But uh, so I'll first just summarize the results of these developments. So before that, for Schrodinger operators, for ergodic Schrodinger operators, uh, for, the, for okay, quasi-periodic Schrodinger operators, uh, uh, all existing results were entirely one-dimensional uh, and mostly perturbative. And uh, John's work was bringing all these ideas uh, uh, his first paper in this field was joined with Misha Goldstein, and then he also collaborated with Wilhelm Schlag, and also a little bit with myself. But uh, basically, uh, I'll show some list of papers to you a little bit later. It's impressive. Uh, he obtained results for analytic potentials, multi-frequency, multi-dimensional, so he really kind of, uh, uh, so these, these ideas allowed to do something that was absolutely not possible before. For nonlinear Schrodinger, for example, uh, again, as I mentioned, KM results only allowed to treat dimensions one and two, even when, even Jan's own KM result, it was just dimension two. And with this technique, he obtained the results for any dimension, that's in his book. And uh, remember I said that this was an 80 page paper, and this is a maybe a 30 page chapter in this book for any dimension. It's a lot slicker. And uh, then it had further extension, his work with Wei Min Wang, who is present here on random nonlinear Schrodinger also was kind of based on some of these ideas. So uh, let me tell you a bit more in substance of what were the new ideas. And for that, I need to first explain the uh, Ehrlich Spencer multiscale analysis. Well, I will not explain it, but I will say it some very, simplistic basics. So basically, it uh, uh, deals with the concept of a good box. And uh, we say that the box is good if uh, the Green's function of, uh, so we look at the restriction of the operator to this box and look at its Green's function at fixed energy E, and uh, good box is a fixed energy uh, concept. And we say that it is good if uh, there is off-diagonal decay of Green function element and the norm is not too large. So, um, and multiscale analysis allows one to 
uh, kind of go from scale to scale, that's multi-scale, and obtain probability that a box of the largest size, uh, estimate probability that the box of the largest size is good from probability that box of the size L is good. And it is, uh, again, it was developed originally for the Anderson model, so I'm talking in terms of probabilities here. Uh, and how does it do it? Basically, if you, so you want basically to establish some of diagonal decay. In the Anderson model, this issue of boundedness uh, of uh, Green's function with high probability, in the Anderson model with continuous distribution, and that's where the continuous distribution is needed, the issue of boundedness of the uh, Green's function with high probability is actually taken care of by the things called Wegener lemma. It's a very simple and very powerful statement that uh, kind of uh, takes care of this sort of for free. Uh, so the real issue is this of diagonal decay. And the idea of multiscale analysis is that uh, resolvent identity allows you to propagate of diagonal decay from smaller scales to the larger scales. So basically, if you want to compute Green's function from x to y, this is the larger box of size, uh, uh, this was bad. I, me I meant L to the 1 plus C. This 1 plus C should be the power of L, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is a box of size L to the 1 plus C. And uh, you want an estimate of, 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 of diagonal decay here. And you put your X in a box of size L. And then you assume your box is good. Then you have of diagonal decay from to every point on the boundary. And then at every point on the boundary, you can create another box and so on. As long as your boxes are good, you just need to sum up all, for, for all the possible passes. There is a com combinatorial factor here. Uh, but uh, the combinatorial factor, uh, it seems that you have too many passes. The uh, uh, pass can go back and forth, but you, uh, you obtain some exponential decay every time you go from the center to the boundary. And in some sense, the longer your pass is, the better the estimate is. All right. So uh, the combinatorial factor is actually not bad. And Basically, as long if all your boxes are good, you obtain from this resolvent identity, you immediately obtain that the big box is good if the small if all the small ones are good. So then you only need to kind of estimate uh, probability that there are not too many bad boxes. And again, and when the box is bad, when you happen to hit a bad box, you use this a priori bound. Uh, which is sub-exponential. So this is how it somehow works. And again, as I mentioned, there are two problems with it uh, in trying to apply it, say, for uh, quasi-periodic operators that uh, when, uh, so of course I'm oversimplifying here, but uh, basically uh, for the random model, you know, the, if you have probability that the box is bad, then you have, uh, if it is a good probability, you have very small probability that, you that there are two bad boxes, for example, in a good one. All right. It is uh, for deterministic models, you kind of apl can apply the same scheme, but instead of probability, you need to look at measure of the points that enter many bad boxes. All right, and this kind of brings to this first important ingredient, so-called large deviation theory. So for a fixed energy, you need to somehow estimate the size of the set where uh, 
the box where, let's say, a fixed box is bad. And Jan brought some very new techniques for this, uh, relying on subharmonicity, and uh, there was uh, separate techniques for uh, one-dimensional case, and later he developed techniques for multi-dimensional case based on matrix valued Cartan theorem. And this was one powerful ingredient. But then, even once you have that, you see, so suppose you have a good measure estimate, but you don't have independence. So you have a set of small measure, but you kind of need to follow how you, that uh, you don't enter it, that your trajectory does not enter it too often. And of course, if you don't know anything about the structure of this set, you cannot say much. You cannot say much about how ergodic trajectory enters a set of small measure just from the measure estimate alone. So what, and the second extremely powerful concept that John brought here is that um, in the analytic case, again, I'm talking about quasi-periodic situation only, these large deviation sets are semi-algebraic. Semi-algebraic sets are finite union of sets defined by finitely many polynomial inequalities. So, um, they are not semi, uh, this, uh, so they are not algebraic per se, but because green function is, uh, they would be semi-algebraic in some sense if it was a trigonometric polynomial. But for analytic function, he just cuts it off at sufficiently large frequency, polynomially large frequency like n square, and then you, you deal with trigonometric polynomials and they become semi-algebraic and he shows that this cutoff is, uh, doesn't change things much in analytic case. So that was extremely powerful, but still it was not sufficient to uh, follow how the trajectory of, let's say, torus rotation enters this sets, uh, not sufficient to control it. And um, the next powerful idea is that previously people studied things kind of in the space of phases, removing the bad phases that lead to resonances, that lead to small denominators. And uh, he, uh, a simple but extremely powerful idea was that instead he started talking about removing, fixing the phase and removing frequencies. So basically, uh, there will be frequencies such that even if your set is a nice semi-algebraic set, so why is it good that the set is semi-algebraic? So sort of, it means that you have polynomial control on the number of components of this set and you have certain control on the geometry of components. So they are tri triangulated in certain controlled way and then you can follow how the rotation enters, let's say, on the circle, how the rotation enters the intervals, right? So it is similar here. You can follow how the rotation enters this controlled little boxes, right? But uh, it turns out that uh, for certain frequencies, you can simply not say anything, but you can remove it, especially it's powerful in the multidimensional case, you can remove a small set of frequencies of measure, of polynomially small measure, such that uh, the shifted box is good for all shifts from some power of n1 to n1, where n1 is some sub-exponential function of your box size n. And this, uh, it was extremely important, and then, even given all that, it all required another important ingredient, which is Bourguin's magic, right? It is still not so trivial to make conclusions out of it, and it was done every time in an extremely powerful way. So, how much time do I have? When did I start? Six? 
Okay. All right. So uh, it's too bad because uh, it's just the beginning of my talk. <laughs> but uh, so I should say uh, something that. Um, uh, so basically, I think John's motivation for this field was uh, developing of these non-KM methods because he was actually working on the KM methods for nonlinear Schrodinger. But uh, so I need to say something straight here because he actually has always credited me for development of the first non-KM methods. And I really need to explain what is going on. So uh, he, basically, I was invited to give an ICM talk on that and stuff. But uh, uh, it is all basically John's extreme generosity. Because he writes in his book, which he wrote on that, that uh, uh, basically, we, let me read, we rely heavily in both perturbative and non-perturbative setting on the method from subharmonic function theory and theory of same algebraic sets, which turned out to be more robust than previous eigenvalue techniques. And uh, he cites my paper as underlying much of this recent research that it initiated the non-perturbative approach. So this is extremely generous thing to say because my paper was really for this cosine potential only. And John kind of says that. He says some parts of the analysis, meaning in my paper, were restricted to the cosine potential. But uh, extension to general polynomial really analytically the root of the material presented in the book. But in reality, my paper was really uh, so somehow this, without John's uh, work, it would have stayed at this cosine. I, uh, I was uh, there just uh, planning to, uh, I, I was working on developing it a little, but I had absolutely no idea of how it, uh, of, uh, uh, all, all the ingredients that I mentioned that he actually brought in the field, all the some algebraic sets, large deviations, it all comes from his work. It, one needs a lot of imagination to see the traces of it in my work. But there is an interesting story related to that. So, and it is how we first met with Jean, and it was in 1995. And when Jean and Mei Chu came to Irvine to give talks, they brought little Eric with them. And uh, so it was uh, at Irvine, everyone was very excited. I think it was maybe the very first time ever that a Fields medalist visited Irvine. So people lined up to meet with Jean. And of course, not me, because, uh, well, who was Jean and who was I? And uh, I was actually just hired there. I was very young. And, but to make it worse, I was previously at the same department. I started as a part-time lecturer. So it was not a good position to start with. And I literally felt like the lowest person in the department. It, uh, the chair, when I was hired, made it very clear to me that I was only hired because they needed to hire a woman, and all the other women turned them down. So, <laughs> and then, so John comes, and then suddenly someone uh, runs to me and says, Harry, John Burgin wants to meet with you. And to, it was a true Cinderella moment for me, right? because why would he want to meet with me? And it turned out that uh, he, learned about my paper that was published recently. I have no idea how he learned of it. It was before archive and everything. And he wanted to hear about it. So I told him basically the argument. It was not a very long conversation. But I saw some people already mentioned it. So many people who dealt with Jean know how, uh, what does it mean that his eyes light up. So his eyes lit up, and he said, that's wonderful. 
you trivialized Froelich and Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that maybe that was actually his motivation, right? To further trivialize Froelich and Spencer, right? And uh, so a few years, uh, actually, uh, my biggest regret in life is that I didn't see the moment I didn't try to enter any collaboration with him or anything. We had no communication since then for a few years, but later, and this is actually not the paper he mentions in his generous thing he writes in his book. What he mentions is the paper that I wrote a few years later when I realized some final ingredient in to actually make it sharp for this cosine problem. And then soon after, uh, so back basically about a year after I submitted this paper, uh, again it was before archive, it was not on the archive yet, but then I received an email from Ellie Gustafsson. And this is an email with the paper, she says Jan Burgen wants me to send it to you, a paper by Burgen and Goldstein. And this is a paper where they, this is Jan's first paper in this field where they proved the result for analytic potentials. And I must say, originally I got extremely excited simply because on the technical level, uh, this paper contained some statements that I kind of could have only dreamt about and I thought, oh, it's so many possibilities now, maybe I can do this and that. And I uh, wrote John some comments about this paper, because this is how our correspondence started. And uh, then uh, about two weeks later, I receive another email from Ellie Gustafsson. <laughs> and uh, that was actually something that I thought where I could maybe apply this technique, but okay. So my excitement slightly wanes, <laughs> and I start panicking instead. Uh, and again, I think, okay, but maybe, they don't realize, but maybe you can go multidimensional with these ideas, right? And then, okay, yes. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I did feel kind of <laughs> devastated at some point in the middle of this, uh, but, uh, uh, and I was seriously thinking of quitting this field because, well, like one cannot stay in this field when John Borgen is there with all his might, right? But I actually had to refer some of those papers. So I had to read them. And I must say that it actually, really reading those papers, I decided to really read them, and it changed my life. Right, so it's, uh, First of all, I learned that you can call, you don't need to worry about stupid constants. You can call every constant a C. And <laughs> right, everything is falls into place so beautifully. And you don't even need to worry about stupid combinatorics, right? Stupid combinatorial factors, like in this multi scale analysis, right? You just. Notice that everything is n to the c, and n to the c is uh, definitely beat by anything exponential, so it all works beautifully. It was extremely empowering. But on the uh, serious side, uh, indeed, uh, I kind of uh, went, by reading these papers, I went from uh, sort of devastated feeling to extreme excitement that actually this is, uh, I must say that before that I never read Burgen's paper. I, have no, I, had, I didn't read his M papers, I didn't know about them. I didn't know what he's done, I just knew he was Burgen, right? But once I read them, it uh, really, I think it uh, kind of uh, was transformative for me. It made me into a different kind of a mathematician because once you read Jean's paper, 
your mind never goes back to its previous dimensions. And uh, right, so I don't have time anymore, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just uh, skip through. It's so sorry. Okay. So there are several papers that John still has to write in this field. And uh, I kind of uh, feel very sorry about the fact that uh, I didn't finish them in time. And I always felt that uh, John doesn't care about another paper and gave priority to other projects. And at some point, John told me that you should hurry up or you will be late. And I told him, oh, you know, you cannot go before we finish this project, so I better postpone. But uh, in a sense, uh, I feel very sad because I know how important it was for him to, till the end, to get his papers out, to get them published. And, but on the other hand, I think I was right. So. He definitely is not gone before it's finished. And long after that, he is not gone before his ideas are at least fully understood. And there, is, there are so many papers of his that are not actually yet, that were so much ahead of its time, that they're not yet understood by the, com are not yet understood by the community. And that I believe there are huge riches hidden there and um, Jen is certainly not gone. <laughs>